Hello, my name is Chase, a site historian here at the Edison Ford Winter Estates. Thank you for joining my little discussion on Harry Bennett, the Hatchet Man. Any questions throughout the presentation, please save those towards the end. We'll have time to discuss them. Here's Harry Bennett's beginning. He was actually born in Ann Arbor, Michigan on January 17th, 1892. Actually, a photo right here of Ann Arbor in the 1920s. Moving on, his education actually went to the Detroit Institute of Fine Arts with an education in sculpting and painting. Very well-rounded gentleman, but really shaped his early, his early career in a sense and also growing up was actually working for the U.S. military, actually serving in the Navy. He joined in 1909 at the age of 17. He saw combat in Veracruz, Mexico in 1914 due to the U.S. occupation of the city of Veracruz and Mexico. He also didn't just fight. He actually played the clarinet for the service band. He drew for the Navy magazine and also boxed. He was actually pretty good. He went under the name Sailor Reese. So Harry Bennett, a well-rounded gentleman. The thing is, though, how does he meet Ford? How does he build that relationship? Well, first off, it starts in New York City with Harry Bennett thinking of re-enlisting in the Navy. And while he's thinking about it, he gets into a fight with his other sailor friends and all gets sent to prison, sent to jail. But Arthur Brisbane, a famous journalist at the time, actually bailed him out and all his other friends. His friends ran, his friends ran off, but Bennett stuck behind and talked to Brisbane, who actually said, Harry, do you want to meet a friend of mine? And that friend was Henry Ford, who actually offered him a job. As Henry Ford did always want to give a fair, a fair shake, in a sense, to African-Americans, disabled, and also ex-convicts. So Harry Bennett's got a job with Ford. What does he do? Well, remember he drew for the Navy magazine, actually worked in the motion picture department in Highland Park. There's actually a photograph of the motion picture department room, and this is in the Rouge. But he moves on to bigger and better things. He works at the Rouge. Up in Michigan, this right here is an expansion of the Rouge plant. Early on, oversaw security for the Eagle Boat Project, which was the Ford Department actually building boats for the U.S. military, and also worked security in general. He got some acclaim with his fellow workers by beating up a Polish foreman and winning the, winning the fight, which sounds a bit silly, but it worked out real well. It got uh, Harry some respect and also a chance to elevate his position to get promoted. Now, Harry's real like elevation to fame was dissolving the sociological department with the resignation of Samuel S. Marquis. I see him to the right of Harry, uh, Henry Ford right here. Now, this department oversaw the lives of employees at work and home. It was very controversial at the time as inspectors for the department would actually go to your home, see if you were drinking, if your home was clean. If it was not, you wouldn't get a pay raise. And got a photograph of a Ford employee home right here. Looks pretty rough. The thing is, though, Harry Bennett saw this as intrusion, uh, intrusion on his department and also security as a whole. So eventually got Marquis kicked out of the company. But who he brought in for the service department, for these gentlemen right here, these are all gangsters, criminals, ex-athletes, the uh, those from the lower rungs of society. And they were only loyal to Bennett. These were Bennett's men. And he had about 3,000 men under his department, under his watch by the 1930s. In fact, this new newspaper at the time called it his personal army. And he used it to great effect, enforcing his rule and also ensuring security at Ford Motor and Henry Ford's wishes. Moving on to Bennett's darker side. And that is Harry Bennett had connections with the Detroit underworld and the FBI, actually advised the FBI on kidnapping cases and also worked as an informant telling them who were the big criminals in town, also what deals were going on. He also helped elect police chiefs, mayors, city council members, and judges. As Harry Bennett knew everybody in town, the fact is if you worked for the police department, you probably worked before for Harry Bennett. Also friends with the governor of Michigan, and also served as security for the Ford family. A story about that is that Harry Bennett's men were guarding William Ford, Henry Ford's grandson down in Detroit. A gentleman tried to mug William, but his bodyguards scared him off. And once William asked, should I tell the police what happened? His bodyguard said, don't worry about it, we'll handle it. Well, later on, William said, he saw the mugger face down in the river, dead. So Bennett's men willing to get their hands dirty and also Bennett's connections with the underworld. Now, this right here is a photograph of the Ford Hunger March, which actually occurred second right here. On March 7th, 1932, 
2,500 unemployed and agitators actually marched on the Rouge plant in Michigan with a list of demands. Now, during the Great Depression, people were struggling and Ford was still a big employer in town. And a lot of these work, um, these former un these unemployed per persons were actually former Ford workers laid off. And demands ranged from seven hour work shifts, equal pay and also equal uh, medical benefits, and also even coal just to stay warm during the winter. But one of the demands up front was actually firing Harry Bennett and dissolving the service department. As even by then, they were infamous for attacking employees and also working as spies for Bennett and working towards his will, not the company's. Now, another photograph right here of them marching on the Rouge plant with their signs, hoping for pay, a job, a chance. Well, they were greeted by the fire department, the police department, and also service department employees. Now, once the police told them to get away, it's private property, they crowded. The crowd advanced on them, and the fire department uh, let loose with their fire hoses, and also the police department launched tear gas. But Harry Bennett actually arrived on scene to the front of the crowd and said, what do you want? I can negotiate with you. Well, the crowd was none too happy to see Harry Bennett. They said, it's Bennett. Get him. Actually chucked bottles and rocks at him. They actually knocked Bennett out, hitting him in the head. In the return, well, the police and also Ford Service Department employees opened fire. Five people died in the chaos and hundreds were wounded, either grazed by bullets or actually injured trying to flee the scene. And got a photograph of the funeral march afterwards. Now, Bennett did recover and has also said that a Ford Service Department employee at the Rouge plant on company grounds had a submachine gun and opened fire on the crowd. In the end, though, it was never proven. But Bennett got off scot free. There were no charges set. It was simply agitators attacking employees. And Bennett won some acclaim with Henry Ford. He spilled blood for him, also was wounded in the line of, and line of duty. So, get some gifts get to move up in the world. Now, living the life of luxury, the fact is Harry Bennett, if you didn't know, had three wives and four daughters. They had the best life possible. And also he had multiple properties to his name, gifts from Henry Ford. As on paper, Harry Bennett wasn't paid a whole lot of money, but also he had marvelous homes, he had boats, cars, and other items I'll discuss later on. Now, this home right here is the castle, one of the more famous uh, Bennett properties. It's called as such as it looks like a castle. There were secret tunnels, turrets, and also lion and tiger cages because Harry Bennett, being very eccentric, raised lions and tigers in his home and brought them to work. Now, a photograph right here is not of Bennett's children or any tigers or lions that Bennett raised. Just give an example of what he was doing. And also, he used the lions and tigers to scare other employees at work, bring them to his office and bite people in and frighten them just a way to bully other people and also show off his wealth. Now, about his boats, his yachts. As Harry Bennett had three yachts, but this right here is not Harry Bennett's yacht. This is a Saelia, Henry Ford's yacht, as we don't have a photo of the Esther, Harry Bennett's famous yacht, which is about 75 feet in length. I actually take it out to Lake Michigan. They would have parties all the time. And even though it was prohibition, as no alcohol was allowed, and also Henry Ford frowned upon alcohol. He would still have parties and get drunk. It was also said that Harry Bennett one time fell off the boat into the water. As they tried to fish him out, they would see $20 and $50 bills floating out of his pockets to the surface. As Harry Bennett not really paid a lot on paper, always had a lot in cash, either gifts from Henry Ford or for some uh, nefarious doings. Now, to the 1930s, the late 1930s, times are changing. This one right here is a photo of the Rouge plant in the 1930s, an aerial view. And there's another conflict coming. This in terms between the UAW, United Auto, Work, um, Auto Workers Union, basically union forces in that, versus Ford Motor. As Henry Ford had never really bent the knee yet to the union workers and the unions as a whole, GM and Chevrolet had already done so, but Ford was a holdout. So... The gentleman you see right here on the right, these are actually part of the local unions in town in Detroit. And to the left are Ford Service Department employees who are about to uh, do some nefarious doings. And what they did is on March 26th, 1937, 40 service, uh, 40 service Department employees attacked union workers, advocates, clergymen, teachers, and journalists, beating them up. In fact, the gentleman right here, 
actually chuck him down the stairs. Concrete stairs got hurt pretty bad. And later on, you'll see a photo of his injuries. Photo right here, people getting beat up. Any teachers were kicked to the ground. Any journalists, their papers were taken away from them. And also photographers had their cameras smashed. The only reason we have these photos is because a photographer in the back of the crowd saw the violence occurring and actually ran to the police station. He hid there and make sure Bennett's men couldn't attack him and take his camera, destroy the evidence of what's happening right here. Now, this right here, you can see the violence. This is a very brutal attack. The fact is the press across America were furious as Henry Ford was beating up union workers and advocates who were doing nothing wrong. So they're trying to spread the word. And Bennett, pretty ruthless, still attacked them. Now, later on, the United States government actually fined Henry Ford in violation of the National Labor Relations Act, or the Wagner Act, which allowed private sector employees to unionize. It was their right. But Harry Bennett, his control over the company, said, you can't do that. If you join a union or think about talking about it, we'll attack you. The evidence you can see right here. Now, Harry Bennett's power has not risen to its peak just yet. After the Battle of the Overpass, it was legally proven you could join a union, but Harry Bennett actually put spies on the assembly line. Example, see right here. They would spy on employees. If you were talking about joining a union, they would pull you to the side. They would attack you or fire you. As between 1937 and 1941, 4,000 employees were fired by Harry Bennett due to union sympathies or suspected sympathies. You could not be thinking about joining a union, but if they suspect you are, even if it's wrong, you still get fired or attacked. Another photo of Ford employees working. And the fact is, Harry Bennett, if he found union material in your lockers or on your person, which he had the power to do so to search you, he would beat you right then and there. His men were armed with blackjacks, which were like little clubs, or actually whips made of, white, of windshield wiper cords. Very violent. The press knew, but also you couldn't do anything about it. As Henry Ford, a really good employer at the time, and you have no other chance in life. It's the only job you can get. Why would you speak up? Now, see right here, actually passing out union material. If you're caught with this, like I said before, you'd be attacked and fired. So these men have the right to collect it. But if Harry Bennett sees it or his men discover it, you're going to get attacked. Now, what was sparked off conflict was in 1941. It was in June. It was a very hot summer. And also, Ford employees are sick of Bennett. It's the breaking point. They're done. So there's actually a walk-up. There's a strike. First at the Rouge plant, and later on, by day four of the strike, all 34 plants under Henry Ford were on lockdown. Now, we see right here, these are not Ford service employees beating up union work, uh, beating up union workers or protesters. These are the protesters beating up scabs or those who would break the picket line and join Ford and continue to work. It was a pretty violent and turbulent time. As also another example of them beating up scabs who simply wanted to work, but also breaking the union line. They didn't like that. An issue, though, was Harry Bennett was turning this soon enough into a possible race war. As Henry Ford was famous at the time for hiring African-Americans, and Harry Bennett sought to turn that to his, uh, his benefit, he armed all the African-Americans still in the plant with steel pipes and buttons that said 100% for Henry Ford. And he promised, if you stay here and don't join the union, if you don't leave the company, we'll pay you overtime. And he was actually pretty good on his word for that. And also, these uh, workers still in the company were given jeeps to patrol the property, make sure that no union workers break in or people leave the company itself. Now, Harry Bennett would actually eventually message the president of the United States and ask for National Guard troops. It was getting a bit more violent. Henry Ford was losing money. But the president knew Harry Bennett's actions, knew what he did, and would not approve it. How the strikes ended? Well, first off, the NAACP were actually invited to Detroit to talk to those still in the company, the African-American workers with their buttons, and saying, break the strike, join the unions, and also fight for yourself. Fight for your right for better pay and better working conditions. Another savior right here is actually Clara Ford. This is Henry Ford's wife right here. As Clara was furious alongside their son, Edsel Ford, and Clara threatened to divorce Henry, saying, if you don't stop the strikes, if you don't agree with the UAW and sign the deal, I'll leave you. Now, Henry Ford truly loved his wife, so said, all right, I agree to all demands. And Harry Bennett actually was the head of labor relations, so he actually had to sign. 
can see right here, the gentleman in the back, pretty happy that Harry Bennett, who's not looking too happy right here, had to sign and join the UAW, join the Union. Now, moving on to World War II, where Bennett's just about to reach the peak of his power. This photograph right here is of Willow Run, a bomber plant up north in Michigan. It made B-24 bombers, which I do believe a photo of right here. And Harry Bennett now has competition. There's two gentlemen left to stop his reign of terror. And those two gentlemen are, first off, Charles Sorensen, C to the right. He actually worked on the ground, the day-to-day -day operations, and also a longtime employee of Ford Motor. And to the left, who eventually will start a negative relationship with Harry Bennett, as Henry Ford II, Henry Ford's grandson, and Edsel's child, who eventually would work for the company and later on take control as president. But not just yet. Another holdout was Edsel Ford, actually see in the car right here, looking at his father. Edsel Ford never liked Bennett. Bennett was seen as scummy and also taken from the company. An accountant from Ford actually contacted Edsel and said that Harry Bennett is stealing materials from the Rouge plant. Thousands of dollars every day is leaving the company. Where it's going, they don't know. So Edsel brought this up to his father. His father talked to Harry, who said, the accountant, He's lying, not doing anything like, like that. So the accountant was fired and Harry Bennett was saved. An issue though, is that Edsel Ford at this time has stomach cancer. He's not doing so well. And Harry Bennett used that to his advantage as Edsel was puking in his office due to his cancer, not feeling too good. Do you know what uh, Harry, Harry Bennett would say? Well, he's an alcoholic, he's hungover, he's weak. And Henry Ford would believe him, wouldn't believe his own son. Sadly though, Edsel Ford would pass away in 1943. Henry Ford is heartbroken. And later on, Charles Sorts, Charles Sorensen would leave the company also. He had no more allies. He didn't really have a chance to stop Bennett. So Bennett, he's all alone. He's got his power. And Henry Ford, he is, he is weak. He is heartbroken. Doesn't really have a chance to stand against Bennett. Now, after Edsel Ford passed away, Henry Ford took over as the company president and also sparked anger with the Ford family as he signed a codicil into his will where no president could be named for Ford Motor for 10 years after his death. So who would run the company? It would be Harry Bennett. You see right here at his desk, talking to Henry. Now, thankfully, there was a savior for the family. That was Henry Ford II. You see your photo right here. Fact is, he talked with his family and eventually Eleanor, Edsel's uh, wife, Henry Ford II and Claire would say, Father, uh, Henry, you need to step down. You're not doing too good. And the fact is, if you don't step down, Eleanor actually threatened to sell her stocks to the public, making the company public, which Henry Ford never wanted. So September 21st, 1945, Henry Ford II took over as company president. Henry Ford, his grandfather had resigned. And Henry, Ford's fir uh, Henry Ford II's first action was firing Bennett. Now, a little story right here is that Harry Bennett, after being fired, ran to his office and was destroying documents. And there's said to be smoke coming out of his office. That's because he had maybe nefarious dealings, anything on record he didn't want to be read by other employees or even Henry Ford, Henry Ford II. But a friend of Etzel, John Bugis, in the first row, second from the right, a former FBI agent, hired early on as security and later on a friend of Etzel and later on Henry Ford II, went to the office to talk to Bennett, hopefully to console him. But Harry Bennett pulled out a gun, pulled out a 45 pistol. But John Bugis, a bit quicker on the draw, pulled out a 38 special, a revolver, and said, Bennett, if you don't put the gun down, I'll shoot you right here and now. Now Bennett put down his weapon, and John Bugis left. And by the end of the day, Harry Bennett was done with the company. He had left Ford Motor, left behind a good chunk of his history, his life. Now, Henry Ford II had some big shoes to fill and also to clean up after his grandfather's mess. And one of the first actions was firing Bennett's employees. The service, the service department was trimmed down. And let me pull my documents right here. Thousand men were fired in one month by Henry Ford II because he had said these were not Ford men, these were Bennett's men. So these crooks, these criminals, these ex-athletes kicked to the curb. But the end of Harry Bennett's life, he spent some time in the mid um, in the Midwest, but later on would actually pass away in Los Gatos, California, in a nursing home 
on January 4th, 1979. And so ends the tale of Harry Bennett, the hatchet man, and one of the most infamous employees in Ford Motor Company history. Now, move on to some of my sources right here. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. Have a good rest of your day.